Textbooks have been a staple of education systems around the world. It's the curriculum for which many tests are based on, and there's a huge industry of textbook publishers. However, some experts argue that textbooks aren't the best way to engage learners. And that's why we're honored to have teacher, speaker, and author of Ditch That Textbook, Matt Miller, join us in the EdTech Lounge. He's been named one of the top 10 influencers in EdTech and e-learning worldwide by Analytica. Matt is a Google certified innovator and his blog has thousands of subscribers in more than 200 countries. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. It's it's an honor to be here. You you studied journalism. Yeah, I studied journalism in college. I was I was named the top journalism grad at the college that I went to. Yeah, went out and worked in professional journalism for about uh, three months. I was a newspaper reporter. My wife was a teacher. So the more that I talked to her about what she was doing, I started thinking, you know, maybe I'm not a journalist. Maybe I'm a teacher. What's wrong with textbooks? Like, why don't, why don't we just continue to use the textbooks as is? I firmly believe that we have the potential to do so much more these days than march chapter by chapter through a textbook. I just think if we continue to do things in that way, we're, we're preparing kids maybe less and less for the real world that's going to confront them. What's happening when people People are teaching out of a textbook is that's meaningless and pedestrian. Lisa Heifel was one of the creator of HyperDocs, and mm -hmm. she said, "We don't want lesson assigners; we want lesson designers. So instead mm -hmm. of just picking something up out of a textbook and assigning it to kids, we want teachers who are able to craft and create and design these experiences that will actually teach them things and will actually help them to learn." Can you talk a little bit about? you know, the, the kinds of tools that are available, like from a technology perspective today, that weren't possible, you know, say a few years ago. OER, Open Educational Resources. Yes. The idea there is instead of using a static textbook, we have access to all these different resources and we can kind of pull a little bit from this one and pull a little bit from this one and put it together to be the kind of resource that we need. Mm -hmm. Another one, is to give them access to real, honest to goodness people <laughs> and experiences through, you know, basically what we're doing right now through using video call tools like Skype, Google Hangouts, FaceTime. The third area I think that we can go with all of this is all of these creation tools that we have available too. We, we can now take what we're learning and create something instead of just filling in a worksheet or a workbook page. Is there a dimension that's provided with this kind of real time um, face to face that uh, that we can't get with the, the video format. But when you talk to somebody and you actually look face to face, even virtually, there's that emotional connection that you have where you really feel like you know that person. And brain science even says that the learning is stickier and that it's stronger in the end. Um, it's more personalized because you can ask questions. So, I mean, that's that's a huge resource to have also. What's the, the challenges that we have with homework these days? I started to find that so many of the kids that would do the homework were the kids who didn't really need to do the homework. And the ones who really needed the extra practice were the ones that would never do it, no matter how creative I tried to make it, no matter how fun I tried to make it. Um, you know, they were the ones that just never did it. And so it was almost like the more homework I did, the good started to get better and the bad started to get worse and it created this divide in my grade book. If we're able to maximize the time we have in class to be more efficient and more effective, I think we can reduce our reliance on homework. Is there a way that we can create homework that students would actually want to do at home? If we get kids so involved and interested in a topic in class that they are just you know, so innately fascinated by it that they've got to go study it or do something with it at home. I don't consider that homework. Be able to personalize things to their, their unique interests. And I think the more that we can do that, the more likely they are to want to pursue that outside of class. How does that work at scale? If we are the ones who are doing all of the assigning and doing all the thinking and doing, you know, connecting all of the dots, mm -hmm. I think kids are missing out on excellent opportunities to right. become those lifelong learners. Are there aspects of old games that we can incorporate into, you know, so let's say homework today to make it fun that students would want to do it? If a kid buys a brand new video game and the very first time they play it, they beat it, they're going to want their money back, you know? Yeah. So. They want, they want some of that challenge with games. The great thing is that it's a safe space where if you go and you try to solve this problem and you do it poorly, or if you, if there are flaws and you fail, that failure isn't a killer. Mm. You know, we do assignments 
and we mark kids off for incorrect answers and we give it mm -hmm. back and all of a sudden, boom, that's on their grade. And yeah. then even if they try to improve on that and they prove on, improve on those skills, and even if they show mastery, that that grade from before is still totally stuck in there. And so instead of looking at it as, oh, I made a mistake and now it's on my permanent record. Now right. I think we've got to come to kind of a different, sort of a different mindset on failure. In your book, you also mentioned about students who struggle with anxiety. I remember the story about the student K. Can you talk about the story? Yes, I would love to. This is one of my favorite stories in the book. Yeah, K was a student of mine who, um, I think I had her in my etymology class. In class, she was so quiet. And um, there was one time, even in my Spanish class, where I asked her to do a presentation in front of the group. And she basically refused to the point that her whole group's grade ended up suffering. And so I always wondered what was going on in that brain of hers. Mm. And during one activity, we were able to do a back channel chat. And so I would throw questions out there and because she didn't have to speak out loud and she didn't have to hear have other people hear her voice, she felt more empowered to answer. And we finally got a little insight into what, what was going on with her. That was a huge moment wow. for me. Have you heard back from teachers or other other educators that you've spoken with, or maybe even students and parents about, you know, oh, hey, I read your book or I read your blog or I read, you know, some of the comments that you made on Twitter, something really resonated with me. There was one particular chapter in this book called Choose to Cheat. And it was where oh. I was talking about how how totally swamped my my life as a teacher was. I needed mm -hmm. to think bigger picture and think, what can I not afford to not spend time on? So yeah. in that case, I realized I needed to dial it back in at school and dial it back in coaching mm -hmm. because those were the things that I could do over and over and over again for so much time and I still would never totally get them done. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I learned a lot from managing your own time, managing yeah. like weird priorities in life. Yeah, no, it was my pleasure. I appreciate you having me on the show.